Here's everything you need to know about the March 2024 U.S. CPI. It was another month that was higher than expected, therefore the mainstream pendulum has swung all the way back in the other direction. We're back on sticky, stubborn inflation all over again. In case you hadn't noticed, conventional wisdom does this. Every few months it swings back and forth between, yes, thorough disinflation and oh my god, it's the 1970s. If you recall, we've already been through three reinflation alarms since disinflation began in the middle of 2022, which was before rate hikes, by the way. And the last of those alarms was just five months ago. March's hot CPI, that has the fourth alarm bell ringing and everything in full swing. But people say this time, well, this time is definitely going to be different. But is it? Well, let's start out by looking at a close example to see what history can teach us and give us some sort of context. In the final few months of the preceding year, consumer prices had fallen off sharply, despite the fact that policymakers were highly concerned about inflation risks and pressures, labor shortage, an economy that was too hot, all of that stuff. In fact, the Federal Reserve was hiking interest rates to make sure that, that, that consumer prices didn't get out of control. But... All of a sudden, at the end of that year and then the beginning of the next year, the economy started to show signs of weakening and consumer price numbers decelerated sharply. In fact, they were thoroughly disinflationary for three solid months in a row. Following that, however, even though the Federal Reserve had already said, well, maybe we're going to pause our rate hikes here, suddenly consumer prices accelerate. And they didn't do it just one month, not two months either, but for three solid months, consumer prices were zooming ahead. And officials began to wonder, should we restart our rate hikes? Has something changed as far as inflation? Is that disinflation that we just saw just a flash in, a pan, in the pan? Well, as it turned out, the Fed continued with its pause and then eventually did cut rates because consumer prices increased and accelerated only on a temporary basis. I won't say transitory here, but that's what it means. By the middle part of that year, consumer prices were already settled back down. And even though they would, they would re-accelerate again to not the same degree, to a little bit less of a degree, at the end of that year, the Fed stuck to its rate cuts. In case you haven't worked it out already, the years were 2018 and 2019. The Fed ended 2018 hiking rates, aggressive, hawkish, but that disinflation that showed up actually would continue throughout the rest of the following year, suggesting that the economy wasn't exactly in the shape that everyone had hoped. So rate cuts and eventually a QE that the Fed did not, did not call QE. But in March of 2024, people are saying this time is different. Well, again, as I said in the introduction, we've been here several times already. If you go back to the middle of 2022, when disinflation started, as I said, before rate hikes, disinflation got started in, 20, in the middle of 2022, the three-month rate of change in the CPI had dropped down to a 1.8% annual rate, suggesting that the initial stage of disinflation was indeed underway. But then it would soar. Consumer prices would re-accelerate toward the end of 2022, but such that by November, the three-month annual rate of change was 4.7% all over again. And then it would slow down through the first half of 2023, introducing the uh, more solidly the idea of disinflation. In fact, the three-month rate of change in the CPI got down to 2.1% by July of last year. But then you know what happened after that. Saudi Arabia, OPEC, oil prices surge. Suddenly the CPI in September of 2023 is rising at a 4.4% annual rate. Way too hot, way too high. And everybody said, okay, this is, this is 1973. But as we know now, oil prices fell. The rest of the consumer price bracket failed to accelerate as many who had feared. And the three-month rate of change for the CPI as of December 2023 was down to a 1.9% annual rate. And now we have the first three months of 2024 accelerating back at a 4.65% annual rate, which is similar to last year and the year before in these short-term spikes. Now, as far as the numbers themselves for March, the month-over-month -month change was 0.38% compared to 0.44% in February, so it's actually slightly less, but 
038 or 044, those numbers are still way too high. The question is whether or not this is another short run inflation alarm. What's adding a little bit of drama to it is that the annual rate of change in the CPI actually accelerated to 3.48% in March from 3.15% in February. So the people who watch the annual rates are saying, okay, consumer prices are really accelerating here, but we've seen that too. It isn't just three month rate of change. Nothing ever goes in a straight line, including disinflation. But what's, what's really amplifying the concerns now is that it seems, at least for the last little while, as if the CPI is stuck at a structural level around 3%. And one reason why that may be is because of what's in the core rate. So while oil prices are responsible for the variation in the headline CPI, Oftentimes we overlook that, which is why I have the core rate, in order to, to get a sense, at least to try to get a sense of what underlying inflation pressures might actually be beyond the often very wild swings in crude oil. If crude oil prices do decline again, like they're likely to, given the history of crude and demand destruction and everything else we went over in a recent video, does that leave us with, okay, crude oil prices, gasoline goes down. Does that leave us with an underlying inflation problem in, say, services prices? Because when you look at the core CPI, that seems to be the real issue here. The core CPI was actually unchanged on a month-over-month -month basis in, in March, 0.36%, same as in February, and it was 0.39% in January. And the core rate tends to be stable. And if you do a little bit of math here, it's around 0.36 or 37 or 0.4%. Or that's, that's way too high, which is reflected in the year over year change, which is around 3.8%. So there's this idea that, okay, oil prices are gonna do what oil prices are gonna do, but is inflation actually in the core rate? Because it seems to be stuck closer to 4%. However, as with the, the headline CPI being driven by gasoline and energy, the core rate has been driven by shelter prices, which that's, that's a discussion that we've had before. So in, in lieu of going back over that same terrain, shelter prices are shelter prices. By the way, they're actually down a little bit from where they were in January, but they're still running about half a percent per month, which is again, too high. And there were others, there were other parts of the core bucket that were that were, that were high in, in March as well, including transportation services, but as the name of the term implies, that's also related to energy prices too. But we've seen any number of historical examples in the core rate, like the headline rate, where it can go on these multi-month runs that gets everybody worked up and excited about inflation pressures, only to seemingly, out of nowhere, turn around and disinflate all over again. It isn't out of nowhere. You just have to know what the factors are that are driving it. Let's go back to the prior example that I just did in the introduction with the headline CPA, but now we're gonna use the core rate. Now go back to May of 2017, core consumer prices were actually pretty low at that time. The three month annual rate of change was 0.7%. But then over the next 10 months, core prices started to rise and accelerate. By the time we got to March of 2018, the core CPI was rising at a 3.1% annual rate. That's again, that's a three months change at an annual rate, 3.1%. And that was what had everybody excited. Jay Powell comes in from Janet Yellen, takes over and says, I need to be aggressively hawkish here. We're gonna step up the pace of rate hikes because we think that the core rate is reflecting underlying inflation pressures in the tight labor market. And maybe if we're unlucky, expectations. But almost as soon as Jay Powell came in like a hawk in a china shop, core prices went the opposite direction. Suddenly, in April of 2018, they started to slow down. And by the time we get to August of 2018, the three month annual rate of change was just 1.2%. So while the Fed is aggressively hawkish saying, well, that disinflation, that's transitory, we're still worried about inflation pressures, rates had already come way down. But then they started to accelerate again, believe it or not. The core rate starts to surge up to 2.9% annual rate by January 2019. But by then, the Fed had already stopped hiking rates. It had already been in its pause. 
and the core CPI would, of course, slow down once more over the next four months. And that throughout 2019, rather than accelerate wildly as many had been anticipating in 2018, core rate just kind of sunk down to around 2% and stayed there as the global economy got weaker and weaker and as the Federal Reserve uh, cut rates and did a QE. So no relationship with monetary policy. And as we continuously see throughout history, these things go back and forth all the time in multi-month periods. But that was not a supply shock case. And this is clearly a supply shock case. So maybe 2018, 2019, that's not a good enough uh, analog. So let's go back to 2011 and 2012, which is the aftermath of the last supply shock that we went through. Consumer prices accelerated after the Great Recession's bottom because in large part, part of it was because of coming off that low bottom, but in large part because there was a small scale supply shock, especially in 2010 and into the first few months of 2011. And so what we see in the CPI, the core CPI, we're sticking with the core CPI here, is that by August of 2011, that continued to accelerate and move faster, even after the, the headline CPI had already started to fall off. That's another thing to keep in mind here. The core rate tends to follow the headline down the road. So the core rate was up to a 3% annual rate by August of 2011. And it again decelerates sharply down to a 1.8% annual rate where it was stable pretty much all throughout the next year into the summer of 2012. And then during the latter half of 2012, after the Federal Reserve had introduced Operation Twist, and then after the Fed had announced and started QE3 and then announced and started QE4 at the end of 2012, core consumer price rates accelerated a little bit to the point they got up to around 2.3% by February 2013. But then all of a sudden, while the Fed is quote unquote money printing and stimulating the economy, the core CPI just drops way off. So after that six month period where the core CPI was accelerating at least modestly in the second half of 2012, it just continues to fall off because what matters isn't the these short run changes and the short run variations in these price indexes or prices themselves. What matters is the overall environment that these changes and this variation is taking place. In 2011 and 2012, that was the start of the 2010s disinflation after the supply shock. In 2018 and 2019, you had weakness in the real economy, but also still in the same no recovery, silent depression, uh, 2010s disinflationary period. So the question is, what is the background that we're finding for 2024? Is something different here this year or is it still just a supply shock? Because if it's still just a supply shock, what that means is the supply shock is done. We've had it. It's gone. Supply and demand have been much better aligned lately. The logistical problems that were nightmares back in 2022, those all have been mainly, those all have been worked through. Now we have some new ones to, to figure out, but so far what we're having, what we're seeing is that the supply shock case continues to play out. So all the reasons why consumer prices got going in the first place, they're no longer there. So you literally have to say this time is different if consumer prices are going to accelerate in 2024 on any sustained basis. And that what we're, what we're experiencing right now is not just another of these frequent enough variations in consumer prices. Nothing ever goes in a straight line. And we can, there, are other, there are other indications that suggest the, exactly what I just said, that we are still experiencing the downside of the supply shock. Disinflation is still the overall environment that we're operating in here, despite the individual monthly quirks that come up along the way. One of those ways we can look at is producer prices. Producer prices are, in many ways, a leading indicator for consumer prices. And you look at the U.S. PPI or any of the other PPIs around the world. In fact, you can look at U.S. consumer prices that tend to match up really closely with, say, China's PPI because these are global factors, not local factors. You look at the U.S. PPI, 
Match that up against the U.S. CPI, or better yet, look at the core PPI and match that up against the core CPI or the core PCE deflator, if you're somebody from the Federal Reserve and you prefer that one, what you see is a very close fit. And it tells us that producer prices are more disinflationary than consumer prices, but that the overall direction remains in the direction of, of producer prices. And the reason consumer prices are stickier is because of the frictions involved in that part of the economy, where businesses respond to short-run changes much more quickly, much quicklier, much, much quickly, more quickly, more quickly than changes in the consumer economy can filter their way through to prices and behavior and everything else. So producer prices as a leading indicator, they thoroughly suggest, they thoroughly very strongly indicate the supply shock factors were on the other side of them. They haven't reemerged. We're not experiencing some renewed 1970s style inflation. So what has happened is that, first of all, oil prices have, have reemerged here. Oil prices have rebounded from their lows. Supply, non-economic factors, all of that stuff. We don't have the wider supply shock case. We just have a supply, we just have an oil supply shock as far as consumer prices and the real economy goes. But as we saw last year, an oil price shock tends to lead to disinflation because of the impact it has on the real economy. So once oil prices turn around and they're almost certain to do so, not only does that mean the direct impact in terms of the CPI falling off, just like we saw last year, there's also the ancillary impacts in weaker economy filtering into things like core prices, regardless of the shelter component. So as far as the overall environment for consumer prices and really the real economy, nothing much has changed, including these wild variations in consumer prices and even wilder variations in interpretations of consumer prices. We do this every couple months. As we go through one of these accelerations, and I mean not just recently, but throughout history, we go through these short run accelerations and everybody jumps on board the inflation bandwagon. And then as soon as disinflation inevitably shows up, maybe after a couple months, maybe after several months, it's right back into the same thing all over again. It's what matters is not the Fed nor oil prices really, it's the overall global environment, which is why global CPIs and PPIs and commodity prices are in such synchronized lockstep. And all of the factors that policymakers and economists cite for why inflation will be different this time, the Phillips curve, expectations, passing along oil prices through to the consumers and, and into core prices, they didn't happen last time. They didn't happen the, high, the time before. So why would this time be any different? Again, it's the global environment that matters. And the global environment outside of these short-run variations in the CPI continues to move in the direction of the downside of the supply shock. If the CPI is oil, and to an extent core CPI is oil too, then why do oil prices tend to go lower after going higher? Well, that's what we explored in the video I've got linked below. As always, thank you very much for joining me. Huge thank you, Eurodown University members and subscribers. And until next time, take care.